Hello. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this and uh, watching this interesting debate. Hopefully the discussion between Melanie and myself will generate more light than heat. I do want to thank you for, uh, for watching and we'd really appreciate some more um, comments and in particular more questions about this so that we can tackle those in our Q&A uh, video session together. It's kind of interesting the way that she sets up her opening statement there. It's kind of four somewhat discreet sections. Um, the first section uh, is a little bit of a disappointment in the sense of we don't really have a definition of authority or um, submission. That's kind of key because that's sort of what we're talking about. I use the illustration of submission in my video um, in terms of following um, guidelines or following the lead of another in um, who is in authority and I use the example of a stop uh, of a um, rather of a speed limit. Now, Melanie doesn't give us anything comparable so we don't really have anything to compare to there. She does um, use the term authority um, and then just says there's no restriction restriction on it. Um, oops. <laughs> uh, there are restrictions on authority for both men and women in the New Testament. I think Millie may have slipped up there and may have just said there's no restrictions on the authority of women. And what she meant to say was that there are no restrictions on women that are not equally placed on men. Let's assume that that was her um, reference there to authority. Um, because obviously there are many New Testament passages that qualify or restrict. Um, there's a sense in which being leaders in the New Testament, we're also being the servants. However, we want to talk about ways in which it's restricted for women uh, that might not be equally restricted for men. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit then and talk about um, the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, um, and see what we can glean on that. Now about Timothy, and Paul's writing to Timothy in the pastoral epistles, um, Melanie uh, brings up some abusive faction which may have arisen in the church that Paul's addressing that would have consisted of women. So the key question is, is Paul just addressing a rogue female faction in some churches in, in or around the area of Ephesus? It does not, there isn't necessarily any indication that the problems that the churches were experiencing there, that Timothy is ministering to, um, with, with Paul giving him guidelines, giving him instructions, there's no evidence that this is restricted or limited to women. Um, there is reference to those who are attempting to resurrect portions of the Old Covenant law. Um, there, there is reference to problems that the church is experiencing, um, but there's no sense that 1 Timothy chapter 2 uh, verses uh, 11 and 12 where Paul is saying, I, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have or usurp authority of, over men. There's no suggestion that the, the problems are the major uh, wrong teaching was being given by women in that culture. As a matter of fact, as I pointed out in my opening statement, if Paul really wanted to suggest that there was just a particular type of teaching that was misguided, that women were being restricted from, he could have used, used that Greek term heterodidaskalene, didaskalene, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the idea of wrong teaching, that term could have been used. Melanie brings up a very good and interesting point point about women learning in all quietness and in all submission. In quietness and in all submission. There's a qualifier for all submission. Um, this is one that her grandfather, John Zenz, talks about the Greek word hisukia. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly again. Hisukia is um, quietness or, or um, uh, some versions have silence. It's not silence, it's quietness. But then um, it's referenced earlier in Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2. And in that case, and Melanie makes attempts to make the argument that, well, is are women being enjoined to learn in quietness in a way that everybody in the assembly is is maybe asked to to learn in, in quietness and in submission as, as her uh, grandfather does well actually no um, men in the congregation w whether it's in the congregation or in their homes are not um, enjoined to learn that way as a matter of fact in first Timothy 2 verse 2 it does talk about um, living believers living 
um, in quietness and calmness, but it's in reference to our prayers for those in authority. So if we're praying to those in authority so that we can live godly and peaceable lives, we can live quiet lives, um, one of the translations is calm, so we can live a calm life as a rendering of that, hisukia. So in that sense, it's, it's talking about our role underneath governmental rulers or authorities and the other case is specifically a body context and in that body context that's where women are to learn in quietness and submission. The very next verse is the one where Paul restricts and says I don't want the women to teach um, or to have authority over men in that way. The just just a little bit later, the very next chapter, there aren't chapter divisions in the Greek, so we can't make an absolute distinction there. But right away, a couple verses later, we've got chapter 3, and that specifically is talking about the office of an overseer. And that is where, that is a position that is restricted to men, to godly men in the household of faith. It's very clear. Um, it actually uses the word andros for men, and it's talking about a man of one wife. The gunikas is used of wife. It's very clear that it wouldn't be talking about, let's say, a faithful woman um, who could exercise the office of elder or overseer, um, because then we would have the term for woman who would be faith. We could say, if the term, uh, for example, Paul could have said faithful woman, a woman who is faithful to her spouse. Well, that's not there in the Greek. It just isn't. And again, these exhortations that are repeated um, in the book of Titus um, so it, but in the context of, of restricting the teaching authority of women in the household of faith it's right there just a few verses later so when we're, really when we're talking about 1 Timothy 2:12, it's not an isolated incident it's packed into a larger context Melanie brought, brings up the Greek term oikodespotes for women um, not just being managing, but also ruling. Not, not caring for the households, but ruling. So there they have a really positive, strong sense of authority in the home. That fully agrees with the complementarian position. I think complementarians would just want Melanie and other egalitarians to look at the, again, at the scriptural context. In the context, actually in the very verse, it says marry to marry. For This is for younger widows, so their husbands passed away, but they're still young and productive. They can marry, bear children, and manage or rule their household well. Also in the context, just a couple of verses prior to that, in chapter 5, verse 10. This is still in 1 Timothy, by the way. 1 Timothy 5.10. And they're to be bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, uh, helping those in trouble and distress. So those are all roles that are assigned to women, and they largely take place in the home. That's exactly the case that complementarians are making from passages like 1 Timothy 5. In, over, even in, in the context, of course, being how to what extent should the church uh, have widows who are on the dole, widows who may still have some potential to continue to serve um, not only in the church, but also co to continue to raise uh, families. Um, there's nothing in the text that suggests they wouldn't be doing under that under the headship of their husband. And as a matter of fact, as I pointed out in my opening statement, in Ephesians chapter 5, um, husbands are the heads of over their wives just as Christ is head over the church. That role of submitting to a head um, is not does not mean that husbands nor Christ are representing a, a dominating or a domineering or controlling sense. As a matter of fact, the Greek uh, verb there used in Ephesians 5 is something that's voluntary on the part of on the part of wives. Husbands are not forcing their wives to submit to them. That is not the case in Scripture. Women are voluntarily, voluntarily placing themselves under the headship of their husbands, just as the church needs to be voluntarily submitting itself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Melanie made a sweeping statement about the significance that, the, uh, that there would be that the Bible does not command women or wives to love their husbands um, that doesn't that that wouldn't mean anything necessarily well in a sense she's right uh, but it just so happens that the Bible does actually uh, command uh, wives in a context to love their husbands and I'll 
Um, it actually fits really nicely. It's a great segue into the next point. Um, it's actually in Titus ver, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Um, it talks about, well, let's, we can look at the context. Older women in the church um, have some qualifications, just like elders or overseers and deacons. Well, older women, too, they're, um, they are helping and instructing younger women. So older women are teaching younger women how to love their husbands and their children. Um, uh, older women are teaching what is good. There's a long Greek word for that. Younger women, um, how they should love, how to be self-controlled, how to be pure, working or caring for, taking care of the home, kind, and being submissive to their own husbands. That's the job. So complementarianism is not teaching that women don't have a place to teach. They definitely do. They are extremely needed to teach. The older women are needed to teach those younger women, and then those younger women are going to need to teach their young children at home um, and in other contexts um, in the church. Um, it's just a position of universal teaching authority in the church that women are being restricted from. But there's plenty of excellent opportunities for teaching for women in both the home and the church. So it, that's not the position of complementarianism to deny that status to women. Another point here would be, um, is it not valuable uh, to have the position where you would be teaching and passing down your authority as an older woman to a younger woman? Is that is that something that would be devalued in the body of Christ? No, not at all. That's extremely important. And to deny that is anti-feminist. It's anti-feminine and anti-feminist. Um, she mentions Andronicus and Junia also listed in Romans chapter 16. Um, Junia uh, is certainly well, is well known to the apostles or well known among the apostles. Um, we don't know that they were set up as a teaching authority in any particular church or assembly from the Romans 16 passage. And Melanie doesn't really seem to make the case from the text that they were in that a specific kind of a teaching authority where they'd have teaching authority over uh, men. So assuming that Junia is a woman, and I'm certainly willing to grant that fact uh, textual from the textual evidence, from that we, we don't deduce, you can't deduce that she was holding a teaching authority over men. Um, another problem that Melanie doesn't seem to understand that she has in making her case is that these are narrative. When, when we're talking about a narrative in the New Testament, what actually happens? What kind of a, what story line is taking place here? Paul is not making a normative implication from a narrative statement or a narrative account. So the fact that it's narrated that Paul had certain workers, female workers under him who were very valued, very prized, we don't, you can't derive the implication from it that it's normative that these women would be elders or overseers in churches that Paul set up. We, that does not follow. It doesn't follow logically at all. And Melanie doesn't, doesn't even make that argument in her opening statement. So I just want to point that out.